Hello, everyone. It's Jean Sachs, the CEO of Living Beyond Breast Cancer. I hope everybody is doing well and is safe and is finding ways to keep occupied and stay positive during this very challenging time. For the past seven weeks, Living Beyond Breast Cancer has been working hard to bring you content that is important for you to know if you are in active treatment for breast cancer during COVID-19. And I'm really pleased today that we have Dr. Nicole Simone, who is a radiation oncologist at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, right here in Philadelphia, where Living Beyond Breast Cancer is based. And we know it is a hot spot, and we know your hospital has been really active. Um, so first of all, welcome, and thank you for all you're doing. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Great. So we have a, a bunch of questions, so I'm going to just get right to it. We know that there have been some changes in guidance for radiation oncology from some of the large associations about how to safely deliver breast cancer radiation treatment during this time. So can you just tell us about that? So ASTRO actually is our, our national um, body for radiation oncology. And so far, they've actually been kind of leaning uh, in, in terms of breast cancer on the Surgical Association and, and ASCO as well. Um, several institutions have created guidelines, but there hasn't been one big consensus um, in terms of radiation. So we've created our own um, at Jefferson. So tell us how you're, how you're managing early stage patients. So early stage, we're taking a look at the... Um, you know, we, there is a window of which uh, radiation works really well, and we know that. And there have been studies looking at, can we delay radiation if it's needed in certain subsets of patients? Um, and the answer is yes, we can delay the start of radiation. So if a woman has had surgery, um, we can probably wait 8 to 12 weeks uh, after her surgery to start the radiation. Um, so we are doing that and we're working very closely with our medical oncology colleagues so that if a person is estrogen positive, um, there's the likelihood that we'll start them on an anti-estrogen therapy like tamoxifen or an astrozole to start. Um, and then they'll just delay their radiation a little bit um, safely knowing that they're doing something to decrease their chance for recurrence during that time period. Um, on the other chance that it happens to be a triple negative cancer or HER2 positive, um, we are looking at the size of the cancers to determine whether or not we should bring patients in. Um, remembering that this is a curative window, right? We know that we can cure these patients and we don't want to do anything um, that would offset that chance. So we're taking each patient case by case, um, looking at their estrogen status, progesterone and HER2, and trying to make a decision of whether or not something can safely be delayed um, based on literature that we have or whether or not we should bring them in right away for treatment. That's helpful. What if you are someone who was already in the middle of your radiation course when the pandemic hit? We, we continued people. Um, we, you know, we've done a number of things, and I think throughout this country, people have done a, a number of things in departments to keep our patients safe. Um, and so we've been very vigilant about having Patients wear masks. Every patient that walks in the door gets a mask, gets a temperature screen. Um, we're wearing masks as well, which is a little uncomfortable because I can't smile at my patients <laughs> anymore. Um, but, you know, and everything's being wiped down between patients, their exam rooms, the doors, the exam uh, tables, the chairs. And so um, we've taken all the precautions and we've done um, a, a fairly good job. We've actually had no COVID positive patients in our department so far. So um, we've been really lucky, but we did continue um, taking those extra precautions and just reassuring our patients that we're doing everything we can to keep them safe while they're undergoing treatment. Great. I mean, it's, it's very hopeful that you haven't had any positive patients that I'm sure everybody's really happy to hear that. What about for the, your patients that are living with metastatic breast cancer and, um, but have been recommended to have radiation therapy? Yeah, so we're, we're treating patients. Um, and as you know, two patients with inflammatory cancer, there are some things that just can't wait. Um, and so I think taking into account how quickly can we get the radiation done, essentially? Is there a shorter fractionation that we can treat with, something um, with fewer days? We will try that at all costs, so especially in the metastatic setting. 
Is it pain that you're being referred to? Can we just treat with one treatment? Um, and, and those types of things are being taken into account. So just the number of trips into the radiation department to try to minimize um, our patient's exposure. Okay, that's helpful. So I know our, our community does wanna know if you're having radiation therapy, are you, are you immune compromised? No. <laughs> so, um, you know, the radiation is a very local therapy. And when we treat with radiation, whether or not we're treating your lymph nodes in an extensive area encompassing the breast and lymph nodes, um, we're not really targeting anything that will, you know, suppress your immune system very much. Um, you know, there's some ribs there that really don't carry very much bone marrow. But other than that, our patients are usually in very good shape. And, and usually that's the time that we start talking about adding in things like exercise and diet too, because we know that people are recovering from um, their chemo and everything else. So that's usually the stage where people are in good shape. So for someone who's early stage and had chemo first, how long are they immune compromised? I mean, I know they wait until they have radiation. So what's that window? That depends. That's a tough okay. question. Probably better for a medical oncologist, but um, you know, a lot of patients actually do fairly well. It's the patients that become neutropenic, um, as you know, that we're a little bit more concerned about, and that window may take a little while longer. But generally, by the time they're referred and starting their radiation, they're they're in a safer place. Okay. So for your patients, are are you just telling them to follow the CDC guidelines in terms of being? protecting themselves or are you asking them to do anything additional? Yeah, no, I, just follow the CDC guidelines. And I think we're recommending that for all patients, whether or not they've had chemotherapy, we want everyone to be safe. Um, you know, this, this virus um, can affect people in many different ways. And we have no idea which patients those are, which are going to be affected um, more significantly. So we're really, you know, ex telling patients to be very careful, minimize their outings as much as they can while they're doing their radiation or, or any cancer treatment. And in general, how, do you, how are your patients reacting to all of this and how are they doing during this time? You know, I think it's, it's disconcerting for everyone, um, whether or not you have cancer. Um, and our cancer patients obviously have, um, you know, they're already dealing with something and now they have to have another worry in their lives, which isn't very fair, right? Um, and so emotionally, I think, you know, it's affecting everyone and, and to try to keep the positivity going in the department and everything is really important and to find things that can make you happy once a day, if it's, you know, even something little um, is really important to carrying on right now. That's great. So I want to just talk for a few minutes about clinical trials. Um, I know that there have some changes have been made. So the first question is, what is going on with clinical trials um, specifically for radiation therapy? And then I know there are two trials you've been involved in, one about a shorter radiation course, as well as another one more about caloric intake. So, so all, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> all clinical trials are on hold right now, unless it's something so novel that, um, you know, could lead to better cures. So um, I don't, most of our breast cancer clinical trials are, are closed right now. And the reason for that is just minimizing. We still want you to get your treatment if it's necessary, but we want to try to minimize your contact with anyone around, right? Um, which is why another precaution that we're taking is, is not allowing, unfortunately, people to bring, um, you know, a friend or a significant other into the hospital. So that extra person that you would see for the clinical trial or something else or an extra blood draw, whatever it is, we're trying to minimize all that just to make sure our patients are safe. So at the moment, everything is on hold until um, we get a better handle on this. And it will probably be a few months, I'm guessing, until we have things up and going. Um, we do have some clinical trials um, that will be open in a few months, um, looking at caloric restriction. How can we change your diet during the course of radiation? Um, we have some, some evidence that if you're able to decrease your calories a little or eat the right calories, and we can talk about that, that perhaps the radiation may work better. Um, and we can also talk about long-term, um, you know, habits and how that's related to breast cancer. So, um, you know, it's a great trial. We do a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one counseling for our patients, what they're typically eating now, what they might do to change that. Um, the one big thing that we know from the Nurses Health Initiative that was published, um, that was over 5,000 people um, who had breast cancer. 
who were actually nurses, um, who were very well when they enrolled on this trial, um, what we know from the 5,000 women who actually did develop breast cancer is that they were able to maintain their weight or drop their weight a little bit. They actually had better outcomes in terms of survival and local recurrence. Um, so we try to you know, use that as our springboard for recommending some, some dietary changes, knowing um, that right now when nobody's moving very much, right, everybody's a little bit more sedentary um, and that we're, when we're giving um, hormone therapy like tamoxifen and anastrozole, which are known to decrease um, our metabolism, that it's really important to watch the calories that you're taking in um, to make sure that you're at least maintaining your weight during this time. So Dr. Simone, even though that trial's not currently happening, is there a website or a place that our community could go on and read about it and maybe they could think about incorporating some of the healthy eating habits? We don't have one right now, but that's okay. a great idea. We'll get one up and going. <laughs> okay. Well, if you have any resources, I, I, I think our community would be interested. And when this is over, we'd love to talk more about it. And, and what about this, the idea of having shorter courses of radiation? So the standard, you know, when, when initial trials were done looking at breast conservation in the late 70s and early 80s, um, the standard of care was to deliver 30 to 33 breast cancer treatments um, based on those randomized trials. And we know um, through that data that's mature, um, meaning there's 25 years of follow-up, that our patients do very well with that standard 30 days of treatment. Um, there were then trials done in the UK and Canada suggesting that we can shorten that a little bit to 16 to 20 treatments or 21 treatments. Um, and at 10 years, so those data were published at 10 years and a little longer, um, have shown that 30 treatments is exactly equal to those 16 to 21 treatments. Mm -hmm. So the standard in this country has really moved um, towards incorporating that, that lower um, fractionation schedule. Um, the one thing that we do keep in mind is if we're treating the lymph nodes, um, sometimes we still are sticking with that 30 treatments because it's a little bit safer for, um, you know, long-term toxicity of the brachial plexus in your arm movement and things like that. So, um, so that's the one caveat. So if we're just treating the breast, our standard has now become the 16 to 21 treatments. Recently, there's been a few trials done in Europe as well. Um, looking at something called the FAST trial, F-A-S-T, FAST, or the Fast Forward trial. So both of those have been done um, and are showing really promising results with actually decreasing that 16 to 21 treatments to only five treatments. Um, yeah, so uh, we're all excited about that. Um, and the, the jury's still out a little bit. So um, as you guys pointed out, the Fast Forward trial was indeed published um, just a few days ago. Um, the FAST trial, just to tell you how it works, is there's five treatments that are given just once a week. So the patients only travel in um, for their radiation once a week. The FAST forward trial is actually five treatments, but all in a row. So they're mm -hmm. consecutive days. Um, and both actually look like they're going to do very well. Um, but the jury's still out a little bit on, on a few issues. A lot of the patients that were treated on those trials did have smaller tumors. So they're the average size of those were about one and a half centimeters. Um, and most of them, about two thirds, were over 50 years old and had a very low grade tumor. So it was either grade one or grade two. Um, so they have done well. Um, the results were published at five years. And as you guys very well know, we, don't, we love five year results, but we really want those 10, 20 year results for our early breast cancer patients. So. Um, until I see complete mature data, um, I am recommending it for patients um, who fit criteria, who have smaller tumors, who are low grade, um, and who are, you know, at least over 60. And so we talk about that with our patients. And we've actually been doing that at Jefferson for several years now, um, and have had great results, actually. So um, it is a way to get this done a little bit faster. The other caveat, too, is in that fast forward trial that was just published, um, a quarter of the patients actually got a boost. So even though it says that they had five treatments, a lot of them, a quarter of the patients either had five or eight additional treatments. So um, if you read the headlines, it looks pretty good, but then <laughs> you realize you're almost getting to that 16 treatments um, area as well if they had eight additional boost treatments. So 
Um, so I think it's great. And that's really something that during this COVID period we're paying attention to is, does our patient really need to come in the 16 or 21 times or can we shorten that and offer something else if they have a low grade tumor? Um, and so we've changed a lot of patients to that. That's, that is really exciting news. And Living Beyond Breast Cancer will certainly write more about this, um, but I appreciate your comprehensive overview. Just keeping in mind that we do have a national audience, um, is this something that moving to 16 treatments away from 30, is that pretty standard across the country or is that institution by institution? No, that's pretty standard now. Um, okay. We have done a large a trial in this country, one of the NRG trials, to look at a subset of patients who are a little bit more at risk. So the patients that are less than 50 years old who uh, may have had chemotherapy. So we're waiting on the results from that. Um, but most patients who are low risk early breast cancer, that is the recommended standard actually from Astro. Okay, that's really helpful. Well, I wanna thank you so much for, for taking time out of what I'm sure is a busy and stressful period of your life um, to share this information. And again, we will write more about this. So um, to our community, know that check back and we'll get more information about these trials and certainly let people know when they're up and running again. So in the meantime, Dr. Simone, I just wanna thank you and your colleagues and all the healthcare providers that are working so hard um, to keep us all safe and healthy. We are, we are greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, and to everybody else, please stay tuned to Living Beyond Breast Cancer, our website, lbbc.org. Remember, we do have closed Facebook pages. So if you're looking for support, log on and we will add you. These communities have been really active and um, you really get answers to your questions in real time. So everyone stay safe and stay strong and take care. Thank you.